we have discussed in the previous session or couple of sessions about uh, marketing strategy implementation in a new market or in an emerging market uh, for a new product or for a growth market. So, if we refer to our uh, well known um, life cycle graph. So, we have discussed about the strategies here, we have discussed about the strategies here. Today, we want to discuss little bit about strategic issues that are important for the maturing market or for the declining market. Now, the important point to understand is that just because a product is old or has been there in the market for quite some time, it does not necessarily mean in that case that that product is declining or that product is in trouble. So, which means that maturity is not same as decline or as we approach maturity it is not necessary that decline is imminent because products may actually spend a lot of time at this stage. And in fact, if a product is at this stage for a long time, it is very good for the marketing organization, because you can make tons of money at that stage, because most of your investment has already been amortized. Your assets may be almost at zero value on your books, the production assets and you are still raking in revenue. So, which means your profitability can be very high at this stage, because you may be a very dominant player, because other people might have already been shaken out or you might have already absorbed, uh, merged with or acquired many of your earlier competitors. That is what happens in this uh, stage, uh, where actually some shakeouts happen at this stage. So, maturity is not necessarily declined and we can see many examples. For example, say Horlicks or Bone Vita, they, these products have been there for a long time and they are still doing going strong. Uh, there are variants that have been introduced, which is a strategy important for this uh, matured stage, which we will discuss. But the point is therefore, that just because uh, Horlicks or Bone Vita or Johnson's baby shampoo, they have been there for a long time. Uh, it is not that they are actually unprofitable. In fact, it can be uh, actually exactly the opposite of that. It can be very, very lucrative business. So, the matured stage or the decline stage are important marketing arenas um, uh, and could be quite fruitful uh, for a marketing professional. Now, one of the important question that is is, uh, is it is always a um, uh, sort of a puzzling uh, issue to know where you are actually. Uh, I mean, are you here or are you here? Are you actually on a fast decline or uh, is it going to be a slow decline? These issues are, so is this going to take shape like this or is it going to go like this or is it going to go like this. Now, it is almost, it is quite difficult to predict where you are and how it is going to be once this stage is reached. So, how to detect maturity? There are some solutions or norms given in the literature. Uh, some people say, 
that if your TAM2, remember we had introduced this, is more than 50 percent of TAM1, uh, that means your addressed market, total addressed market or served market, if this is more than 50 percent of the total addressable market, that means the market that is available logically to you, that means you have already covered 50 percent of that market. In that case, uh, we, we can say uh, you know you are approaching maturity or some other authors have said that if you see declining sales over 12 quarters, uh, then uh, you have to detect uh, or you have to investigate at least that whether your product or your market is maturing. Uh, important point here is that uh, these are some concepts, they are not universally applicable, they are not always true, you have to always look at your own context and your own market and even if this TAM 1 is more than 50 percent, uh, the TAM 2 is more than 50 percent of TAM 1 or uh, there is a stagnation or there is decline, that does not mean um, you know there are no other opportunities. Uh, for example, a great instance is uh, that of uh, the water filter market. Now, Eureka Forbes, uh, the market leader, uh, pioneering uh, uh, marketing model uh, implemented in the Indian context, uh, who went door to door, created a direct sales uh, model of their water filters and were quite successful with their water filters as well as uh, with their vacuum cleaners, uh, both uh, very relatively new product at that stage. And they actually replaced uh, the old uh, candle type uh, water filter um, and, and, and was doing quite well. But at certain point of time, maybe 5 years back, uh, maybe at the beginning of the 21st century, they had almost covered um, the big metros uh, all across India. So, Bombay, uh, Delhi, uh, Madras, Bangalore, Calcutta and such places almost uh, uh, all the possible buyers had some model of Eureka Forbes. In fact, uh, it, it goes to their credit uh, that uh, uh, their brand name became synonymous with this kind of um, um, uh, filter. But they neglected or rather it was not uh, on their charter to look at um, these uh, candle filters, because uh, in a way they felt that is what they obsoleted. But then came people like Tata Swatch or people like uh, Purit from HLL, they brought in filters which introduced lot of novelty and uh, technological upgradation in the candles. And the value proposition was that uh, they, uh, it could be used even in spite of power interruption, it, because actually th these models did not need any electrical power and were quite good, because they were using now uh, nanotechnology or uh, improved uh, concepts, uh, quite innovative implementation in the design of the filters. And not only that, in the earlier older type of uh, uh, candle filters, people kept on using the old candle even though its efficacy was already gone, but now they have introduced almost that razor and blade strategy that after a certain time you have to buy a new candle, um, because the old candle will no longer let water through. So, uh, they actually have created therefore, a trailing revenue model um, and, and, and possibly we will over the next few years we will see uh, good results coming out of uh, this type of uh, Purit or Tata Swatch and so on. So, a market which was considered to be maturing or was stagnating has now suddenly uh, expanded and got a lot of new buyers and this, uh, these new types of filters are doing quite well in um, uh, the semi-urban and rural markets, where a power supply is a problem. And of course, uh, 
mm, uh, there is a response, uh, good response coming from Kent or Eureka Forbes and so on. Um, similarly, one can look at say shampoo. Uh, from one perspective, if you look at the market like Bombay or market like uh, Delhi, uh, one can say, uh, oh, uh, uh, it, it's a matured market because everybody who can or want to use shampoo is already using some form of shampoo. The market people will say is cluttered and there are too many competitors, there is pressure uh, on margin, there is price competition uh, and so on and so forth. But does it mean uh, that there are no more opportunities? No, on the contrary, uh, if you look at the statistics, uh, perhaps the penetration rate of shampoo uh, in spite of uh, introducing those sachet or one time use packets. Uh, the penetration in um, semi-urban market or rural market will be minuscule. And so, if therefore, if one can come up uh, with, a, uh, with a new concept, with a new type of shampoo, um, there can be uh, enormous uh, opportunity or uh, some people are now reacting against the high chemical content or uh, polluting effect of uh, use uh, uh, shampoo or detergent after use and they are now talking about completely uh, 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 new, bra new new types of uh, hair washing solutions uh, which uh, address these specific uh, environmental or pollution uh, or other uh, uh, green issues. So, therefore, the important point here is that markets can mature, but markets can be regenerated. We have discussed this a uh, number of times before that the S curve can be converted into number of flips through E curves. So, um, uh, so therefore, uh, uh, detecting maturity is difficult uh, and maturity does not mean decline and maturity does not mean that the scope for innovation, scope for new revenue generation is uh, diminished. Now, what happens uh, uh, the possible uh, strategic developments that can lead to maturity and the uh, associated problems and challenges. Uh, uh, one can be this uh, a, a major thing that the uh, social or technological impact uh, on customer needs and desires. Very evident now if we look at uh, say um, uh, mobile phones, uh, just a few years back uh, Nokia had an almost unassailable uh, position which was based on their excellent hardware and uh, very well known uh, user interface uh, which had a very large following because they had a very large customer base and uh, therefore, they are focus continued to be on um, better and better hardware uh, utilizing the power of that user interface and uh, they were almost blindsided by the socio technical move and uh, changing customer needs and desires for more software on their phone, more application download on their phone, uh, the features that could be uh, derived out of a touch screen and so on and there came uh, Google Android uh, operating system uh, which was ported on to a number of high end phones uh, and there were also a large number of very low end phones which in a way mimicked or imitated uh, the Google user interface and Google and, and Nokia was therefore in this pincer attack uh, uh, from the at the top end from smartphone manufacturers like an Apple and uh, Samsung and so on uh, and on the, uh, on the other side uh, they had this huge pressure coming up from low cost uh, manufacturers in China, India, um, uh, Southeast Asia and so on. And so, uh, this was the socio-technological impact and customer needs and desires shifted and uh, um, and, and therefore, it uh, caused this. Sometimes uh, there can be disruptive entries, then there can be uh, products uh, when uh, the leader continues to pursue 
uh, as we will see uh, in a later slide, uh, the, the momentum of more features, uh, more uh, functionalities and so on. Uh, people, uh, we have discussed this before, this whole issue about uh, disruption uh, as a source of uh, innovation or the kind of disruption in the marketplace and the customer's choice um, that is caused by um, uh, innovative uh, low end players. Uh, of course, uh, there are uh, responses which are usual uh, that uh, you know one can actually then respond with global sourcing when your costs are uh, obviously if you are a market leader your costs are going up in terms of salaries of people in terms of your overhead costs and so on and so forth. So, sometimes one responds by way of global sourcing. Global sourcing also can actually help us uh, to deal with this uh, uh, a quick response to the shifting uh, socio technical parameters. Sometimes the uh, maturity is also brought in by regulatory changes and at this stage as we discussed a little while before, uh, shakeouts, mergers and acquisitions become uh, quite. So, uh, we have discussed this again when uh, we are we are reaching the uh, early majority, uh, the pragmatic majority time that is the time when a dominant design has emerged and uh, dominant design means you do not have any more uh, much of opportunity left to create uh, distinctive features. So, product features then become less important and uh, their focus shifts to uh, continuous lowering of costs and uh, therefore, efficiency becomes a premium operational excellence uh, becomes the mantra at that stage and not everybody can uh, make that shift from, um, uh, from distinctiveness or product leadership orientation to operational excellence and um, efficiency orientation at the same time. Uh, people like uh, Intel uh, have shown that they it can be done because Intel uh, everybody thinks of Intel in terms of product leadership because they dis display all those features. They actually obsolete their own product before anybody else can and they have introduced 386, 486, 586 and they have introduced a new product when the older product was doing exceedingly well. This is another important lesson that if you are going to thinking in terms of creating a product platform and if you are thinking in terms of a continuous introduction that is this uh, generation of E curves out of your S curve, then it is better that you do it at this growth stage and that means you obsolete your own product before somebody else does. This is an important uh, lesson that we can uh, derive from the strategies of people like uh, Intel. Uh, but uh, many people do not know that or are or, or, or not con conscious about that not only Intel is a product leader and has been a product leader now for almost a um, uh, few decades, but they are also very, very good in their operations and therefore, their yield or the percentage of uh, chips that are produced out of their line which are uh, marketable are very high because uh, the chips are produced on lines which produce few million pieces within a very short span of time. So, if there is a little bit of quality glitch, uh, you can make an enormous loss just in one run and that is where actually um, uh, Intel has been very good uh, over and over um, uh, years uh, and, and, and they by combining that product leadership uh, continuous improvement in their product feature as well as this operational excellence that gives them this fantastic yield and quality and productivity uh, that combination has been a winning combination and they have uh, therefore, uh, reached the status where they are today. Uh, so, the point is therefore, that this, uh, this flexible and creative portfolio of marketing opportunities you need to create and not when actually you have reached the uh, declining uh, beginning of the decline stage or maturity stage. It is better you do it at this stage when we are at a growth stage because that is where you have the financial power the investable surplus to do that. If you are already cry in a at this stage you are already coping with uh, um, you know increasing cost and decreasing cash flow problem and therefore, uh, at that stage for you it may be difficult to cause that new flip to happen. So, it is better that you start preparing for that creating that portfolio of options uh, right when 
uh, you are uh, at, at, at this stage. Okay. Uh, so, um, because you need to importantly as you approach this stage you have to pursue the top line as well as bottom line growth opportunities uh, together. So, you have to create this different combinations permutations combinations of um, segmentation targeting and positioning that is what we mean by creating uh, product portfolios uh, and that is what we mean often we are actually use the example of Christmas tree that means you have uh, uh, your original product platform and then you can actually hang stuff from there and you can actually create different kind of variants. We often call it also the Christmas tree uh, um, uh, analogy to the product platform uh, concept. Okay. Uh, now, uh, what are the different options? Uh, as uh, this uh, maturity uh, market maturity uh, emerges. Uh, this uh, Raymond uh, Miles and Charles Snow, uh, they had talked about these two uh, some typologies, uh, the strategy typologies. It, it will be good if you just uh, search and look at this interesting concept which they had talked about. Um, the prospectors, the defenders and then this um, uh, in between the analyzers. Uh, this analyzer strategy is fundamentally combining the product leadership as well as operational excellence as we discussed about Intel and, uh, mm, uh, and, and, and at this shows that in such mature industries uh, like that of uh, uh, semiconductors, again as I mentioned that mature does not mean it is declining. So, semiconductor demands are still going on. Um, people had predicted that the technology uh, the Moore's law will, uh, will saturate and there will be no more uh, micro miniaturization that will be possible, uh, but actually now you know we are looking at new uh, types of chips the so called quantum chips or so called uh, bio chips and so on. Uh, where a, a complete new way of uh, connecting uh, transistors are being looked at, complete new types of con transistors are being looked at. So, in this industry uh, uh, technology is still an important factor and that is where actually the analyzer strategy of combining uh, product leadership and operational excellence to win in different segments uh, to create a large number of STP. Uh, uh, clusters and, and, and create winning proposition is, is, a, is a good way of creating competitive advantage in a uh, maturing market. Similarly, if you are a defender uh, which means that you are in a strong position in a market where technology is not very volatile and uh, is uh, the, the um, it is kind of a uh, slow decline kind of uh, market like most of the metal industries are in, in that sort of uh, people have been predicting a replacement of uh, all these uh, commodity metals by uh, improved materials for a long time, but they are still going strong and lot of shake out has happened in that industry. So, we have seen the uh, rise of uh, the metals and we have seen the rise of uh, various kinds of minimals. We have seen the li uh, rise of people like starlight uh, they have actually grown by um, uh, by good um, merger and acquisition strategy and excellent uh, combination of operational excellence and customer intimacy. So, this is another valid strategy uh, that means either combining product leadership and operational excellence in the analyzer type of uh, market position or operational excellence and customer intimacy in defender type of market position when the market is maturing. When you are actually looking at this product leadership and operational excellence combination, the analyzer combination, the uh, kind of strategy very well um, executed by people like Intel, it is very important to remember that many people fall into this trap that I was talk talking about that if you have been a product leader and your strategy has been based on 
uh, creating distinctive position through features and through differentiation. Uh, so, you have been pursuing this uh, features, features, features and fitment with different types of requirements and your best customers and their demands and, and, and superior finish and so on. It creates a kind of a momentum which can itself be a trap. Uh, so, uh, you have to be very conscious that just because you are pursuing product leadership, it is not that you cannot uh, at the same time um, be also very good in operational excellence. And uh, in fact, today it is almost mandatory uh, because the markets, many markets mature quite fast and so therefore, you have to uh, create. We, we, we know that uh, as the market uh, grows here, the dominant design emerges which we just discussed and that means that standards have been set. So, uh, meeting the standards, beating the standards, uh, those also become very, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of a momentum in the company. But to create this uh, very strong combination of product leadership and operational excellence as, um, as, uh, as, as a response to a market where maturity is emerging uh, fast, uh, we, uh, we need to remember that as we have to pay attention to this, we have to at the same time uh, pay attention to uh, these uh, more uh, sort of uh, intangible factors uh, equally. Uh, one important point is to think uh, as we have discussed before, uh, no longer in terms of only products, but think in terms of product service systems, uh, also often known as PSS. And, um, and that can be uh, expanded according to our perception as something which we call PSBS. That means, you have to think in terms of your product service as well as business system altogether, the, your business model and uh, your service and product combination. And this point con concept that is this uh, tangible empathy, assurance, reliability and response, the tier factors that we have discussed uh, earlier. Uh, is a very important way of looking at how you are doing with respect to service associated with your product or in your service um, business or looking at your whole business in terms of the service dominant logic. Um, uh, you know th that is one way of uh, creating uh, this uh, the focus on the operational excellence which goes beyond your plant, but actually embraces all functions within the organization, whether the finance function, the way they raise their invoice or deal with customers uh, with respect to um, uh, payments or the way the sales, marketing, service people deal with the customer. So, uh, so the focus on uh, post sales, focus on long term relation that we discussed in the previous session and, and measuring your performance in that respect using these factors become and then very important and also of course, the whole issue about brand equity which we will discuss in the uh, following sessions in greater depth and continuous focus on customers risk per perception. Because as the market gets congested and uh, somebody who actually gives you the peace of mind, somebody uh, a supplier on whom you can just trust that they will take care of problems if it emerges, uh, it becomes a very compelling marketing proposition. So, uh, managing customer risk perception uh, is, is a way to leadership in this situation. Some of the other uh, uh, dimensions here uh, are um, that uh, this uh, price quality uh, combination that means uh, uh, low price and high quality combination which uh, the Japanese and later on the Koreans have demonstrated uh, in markets like automotive or two wheelers and so on. Uh, that it can be done. Uh, they have done that for uh, many electronic products uh, uh, again and again. And this uh, combination uh, earlier it, it used to be thought that you know high quality means high price. These are the people uh, pioneering people whether it is Sony or whether it is Toyota, uh, whether it is Hyundai, LG. They have shown again and again that no actually uh, very economic pricing can uh, also deliver very high quality. And today, uh, when we think about quality, 
uh, if we apply this product service systems approach, then we have to understand that many sort of uh, invisible that access or ease of navigation or choosing or empowerment of the customer, personalization, uh, perception of security, privacy, these can also become very important strategies in congested market. Um, by, by excelling in these dimensions, one can create a position uh, which uh, can give many added uh, advantages uh, in a matured market, congested market, uh, highly competitive market. So, we were talking about this product service uh, systems thinking and product service systems thinking uh, is uh, thinking in terms of these gaps. Uh, these gaps emerge from those tier factors. We have discussed these gaps uh, before and uh, they can be uh, a very good uh, these five gaps that is gap between the customer expectation and the marketers perception. That means, what you are perceiving you are delivering versus what the customer is experiencing. Obviously, to know this you have to be in the shoes of the customer, you have to have excellent feedback system from your front line. So, that you are not in a fool's paradise at the top floor, where something else is happening on the, um, uh, on the retail shop floor. So, uh, similarly gap between management's perception and service quality specification uh, as seen by the customer, as seen by your own service personnel. The gap between service quality specification and service delivery, which is kind of these two are related and gap between service delivery and external communication. All of these are interrelated, they are interdependent, but they are also as they have some distinctive uh, uh, issues associated with each gap and uh, this uh, whole gap strategy we have discussed before, but it is important to emphasize again that in a matured market, the importance of continuous uh, measurement of these uh, gaps and taking remedial measures uh, become very, very uh, important. Okay. Uh, the operational excellence as we have discussed is uh, absolutely important. So, operational excellence in combination with product leadership gives you the uh, response strategy in a matured market on behalf of a analyzer. Operational excellence and uh, customer intimacy uh, becomes a good response strategy um, in case of a defender market. But what is this, uh, what are the issues with respect to operational excellence in a matured market is a continuous uh, focus on value engineering, continuous focus on sourcing to reduce your cost. I mean ultimately here we are, you are continuously um, trying to create a continuous pressure uh, to bring your cost down uh, because uh, we have discussed this before. Uh, we earlier always used to say price is equal to your cost plus your uh, margin, but today uh, and therefore, if your cost went up, uh, then you could actually push your price up. This was uh, the dream sellers market which we might have had some 30, 40 years back. Uh, in India, we had it uh, for quite some time because of the artificial protections uh, that were there in the marketplace. But today, the whole issue is that your margin, if you want to retain your margin profitability, then you have to look that at this equation as p minus c and uh, understanding that the uh, competition in the market, the fast maturity and the congestion in the marketplace, all that will continuously put pressure on your price. You have to accept that you have to deliver more features per number of rupees, more service per uh, rupee, uh, more um, uh, customer endearment activities per rupee, which means um, you have to also continuously reduce your cost at every uh, point that is possible through your superior operations, uh, by value engineering your product design, by superior sourcing, uh, superior production processes. Uh, um, and also, uh, this is not only the input side or operation side, also on the output side. That means, lower cost uh, uh, marketing, lower cost delivery, um, 
overall continuous reduction in overhead becomes extremely important. And if you are able to do that, then in spite of your competitor seeing what you are doing, they may not be able to respond to your strategy. Great example is Dell. They created the direct marketing model uh, uh, not going through the traditional model that existed at that point of time to going through wholesalers and retailers, which was more like a fast moving consumer goods model. And they created this direct uh, marketing and also they co-opted the customer. The customer did a good part of the salesman's work by creating their own computer configuration and Dell did some innovative work with respect to supply chain and therefore uh, their computer could be actually delivered uh, in parts uh, which came to you and you could actually put it all together uh, quite easily. Mm -hmm. So this two prong approach, one was the operational excellence derived uh, strategy of providing boxes which uh, played with each other quite easily. So plug and play uh, modules and on the other hand uh, direct marketing eliminating all the cost of intermediaries and improving the satisfaction because the customer felt that the customer has participated in the production process all put together the cost continued to be lower and that is why uh, while the satisfaction of customer kept, could be kept at a very high level and resulting in uh, Dell's current position as the leader in that marketplace for quite some time now. While many of their erstwhile competitors have sort of uh, fallen by the wayside. So the whole dynamics of what happened to uh, DEC, what happened to Compaq, uh, what happened to IBM and what is now the strategy of Lenovo, what is now the strategy of HP and how they are coping with this dominance of Dell, all these can be interesting um, uh, validation of this whole issue about how operational excellence can create a very strong position even when the market growth is kind of becoming flat even though it can be uh, sort of a saturating market uh, uh, and possibly approaching in the traditional format uh, towards decline. So just as we discussed about operational excellence, uh, we are coming from that this very important combination of customer intimacy and operational excellence or operational excellence and um, product leadership. So this customer intimacy uh, uh, at in, in this matured market uh, is, uh, is, is not only all things that you need to do to keep uh, your customer satisfaction and uh, uh, going towards customer uh, delight, but there are some very important measures that you must uh, track uh, through your information marketing information system. One of them is retention rate. That means every customer you are acquiring for how long you are retaining them and what percentage of your customer base is uh, continue to be your customer uh, for uh, uh, over a period of time. Uh, recency frequency that uh, frequency that means um, uh, every customer um, uh, how long back or rather um, the how recently they purchased from you that is the recency measure and how many times they have purchased uh, recently from you. And uh, so which fundamentally means that we not only need to have a customer, we not only need to have a satisfied customer. So uh, acquiring customer, uh, then not only retaining the customer and delighting the customer, but at the same time we have to make this pie bigger. Um, and, 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 and that we do one of the strategies we have discussed before that is looking at the adjacent space looking at customers spend share or wallet share as we call it. That means not only what products you are doing, but you looking at the product service system concept. What else can you offer uh, to the customer uh, which will bring you additional revenue. Uh, I mean what you can offer leveraging your uh, competence and uh, not by doing something completely unrelated. And also uh, very important is to look at customer lifetime value and, and, and linking your service level. So there are concepts like 
you know, silver customer, gold customer, and platinum customer. And with each level, uh, this indicates the lifetime value of that customer, and, and then correspondingly deliver higher and higher level of service uh, assurance. But some people also criticize this uh, because they feel that uh, by um, boxing customers, uh, by what they have done in the past, because whenever we are looking at lifetime value, the usual models are based on the data of the, uh, you know, what has happened in the past, what kind of revenues you have got from that customer. Uh, many of the models cannot actually capture very well uh, the what could be. So the potential of the customer, which means we need a finer forecasting model, until and unless those are available, uh, we have to understand this. Uh, uh, this uh, lifetime value oriented um, service level delivery, uh, this silver, gold, platinum sort of thing can sometimes backfire, can actually, uh, you may lose a customer and losing a customer in a mature market is far more damaging because there are many people waiting to take away your customer because the market is congested at that stage. So, uh, so it, it is very important therefore, uh, to tune this, uh, uh, these issues are however, important uh, in any stage uh, for any company. For uh, volume growth in a matured market, uh, there are many uh, innovative strategies that people have done well. Uh, one of them is focus on non-users, uh, very well executed in India by the toothpaste companies. Uh, they looked at people uh, who do not use uh, toothpaste uh, because they have been using various kind of so called um, uh, you know homemade solutions whether that was oil and salt or it was some kind of twig. Um, so, that market was well addressed by the tooth powder which is a kind of an uh, Indian derivative from the toothpaste and in that format it could actually expand the market and whether it was the lal manjan or it was various other kinds of herbal propositions have created new market segments in a relatively mature uh, market. Or uh, this different type of innovations that we are now seeing in, a, in the matured market of toothbrush uh, is again an interesting uh, understanding that how you can focus on non-users and convert them to users. Uh, also focus on solution marketing, uh, that means you, you, you sell uh, conditioner to the shampoo customer, uh, in a way you solve the problem that you might have created and that solution approach uh, gives additional opportunity in a mature market. Or uh, as we have seen uh, the you know Google offering Android and uh, all the other things that you can see on the Google site, uh, continuous addition of uh, newer and newer services can actually uh, keep you a leader even if there are many contenders for that uh, search market. And uh, uh, more convenience and ease of access again can be a very powerful proposition uh, as we have seen uh, from the time of Amazon and today in India. Uh, to the success of Flipkart and many other similar companies that how in a mature market uh, of uh, selling books and music and so on, uh, you can create a very strong position just by creating convenience. That simple introduction of the convenience of cash on delivery uh, made uh, uh, Flipkart what it is today, uh, because they along with that innovation or along with that um, ease uh, delivered to people who did not have credit cards or were afraid of using their credit cards. I mean people knew that uh, this was one of the inhibiting factors of uh, e-retailing in India, uh, but they were the people who actually delivered uh, the solution, delivered the solution efficiently, it was complemented by excellent quality, excellent service response and uh, uh, very good. Uh, replacement strategy or what we call reverse uh, chain and all of that put together give them a very strong position. It is uh, another issue uh, that uh, 
the market in which they are operating is uh, mature but uh, as a company uh, they are a young company in a high growth mode and therefore of course there are other challenges for of high growth like uh, continuous uh, pressure on their cash flow a need of more and more money uh, for uh, uh, enhancing the infrastructure as the um, growth happens rapidly so it's like riding a tiger uh, those are other issues but the important issue here in this context is to see that you can innovate uh, either by focusing on convenience or by focusing on enhanced services or product service system uh, solution marketing and focusing on non users and converting them to user um, uh, can give excellent st strategic advantages in a mature market. Of course, along with that uh, there are also this non user strategy uh, is com often combined with the extended use strategy that means uh, if uh, people were just brushing once you can convince people that uh, with, with good logic that it is beneficial to also brush at night before you go to sleep and or uh, it is better to use a different product um, for washing your face um, uh, and, and use another product for, uh, for bathing. So, you have a soap and you have a face wash uh, product. So, this is kind of uh, extend the use or expand the number of uh, times the customer interfaces with your product service system. Uh, the market expansion strategy uh, can be valid even in a mature stage. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, that can be done by uh, discovering the under penetrated market and even though you can be uh, if you look at uh, ITC's uh, Sunfeast product in the biscuit market, um, their, um, their product lineup is uh, not very different from that of Britannia, but the way uh, ITC is focusing uh, and leveraging their rural supply chain for their other products is perhaps uh, is a battle that is still being rolled out because Britannia also has had a good position in, but uh, ITC has a much deeper and wider uh, distribution chain in the semi urban and rural market and we are observing and, and we, we have this opportunity to be on the ring side of this uh, great marketing battle that is going on uh, between uh, uh, ITC and uh, Britannia or ITC and Parley and so on. And uh, the other interesting uh, strat did this point about wallet share that we were discussing um, uh, this is uh, played together with this market expansion strategy um, and a great example is that of Titan uh, they were very well established very respected in the watch category um, they absorbed uh, the market share of the earlier players like HMT and so on and they became a absolutely dominant player. But seeing that particular trust and uh, from the customer, uh, the brand equity they enjoyed with the customer, they, they leveraged that and introduced the Titan Eye Care. And they have soon now uh, with their fast track model um, uh, products, uh, whether uh, for uh, sunglasses or for um, uh, different other youth products, they have become almost synonymous. Uh, they have given a, a lot of new dimensions to their uh, market position. So, they are now uh, equally attractive to sort of uh, aging uh, population or people who have seen Titan for last uh, 20 years and similarly they are quite attractive to customers who are seeing Titan maybe for the uh, last uh, 5 years or last 10 years. So, they have by expanding uh, the their range in a related uh, uh, value zone and they have uh, enhanced their share in the customer um, spend and and thereby they have executed a, another interesting um, classical strategy uh, in the for uh, um, mature or or sort of uh, coasting market. 
So, that uh, kind of uh, uh, takes us to other more uh, uh, normal solutions uh, that if your own market is matured uh, in uh, Tamil Nadu, then you can uh, like prestige. Now, um, they have been a leader in the southern market and now you can try to penetrate more sectors in the northern market or you can actually go uh, to other regional markets whether in Sri Lanka or in uh, 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 Bangladesh or um, other parts of uh, South Southeast Asia. And uh, so, you can actually go from a mature regional market to the less developed market in other states then to foreign countries. And there are again good examples like say Sagar Ratna which has been a very successful UDP restaurant in the uh, national capital region area but then they have actually used that model and now have expanded to many other cities and uh, they have actually now combined their original service model with different types of packaged food products and uh, they are in a way uh, some of the earlier moves by people like MTR and they are now executing a, a in a uh, Sagar Ratna is executing that strategy in a more uh, modern aggressive and uh, uh, in, a, in, in a way uh, which uh, can give us a good understanding of uh, expansion strategy that can still be valid in a mature uh, market. Uh, similarly, uh, the tire makers uh, many of them have shown this that when the tire market in uh, 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 US or the tire market in Europe or the tire market in Korea approach saturation how they have actually then gone to other countries wherever the automobile growth uh, was coming up and they have moved there. So, these are all uh, different strategies that are uh, more classical. The, uh, the concluding uh, points on this uh, is uh, going to be a sort of a uh, assignment for you that declining market is usually uh, derived from the conditions of demand. So, today if you look at uh, and, and the current and future competitive rivalry. So, if you look at the position of Nokia which we were discussing just now, uh, Nokia is under uh, uh, pressure from below uh, by many low cost manufacturers from China, India and so on uh, where uh, they are standard uh, phones, uh, no frill phones, even their feature phones are under continuous uh, price pressure uh, from these new entrants. On the other hand, uh, they are foray into the smartphone with uh, their uh, new range of Lumia or before that some of the uh, products they have introduced like the Asha range and so on uh, is still not giving them uh, uh, the kind of revenue the, the top line bottom line growth that they had seen for uh, last several uh, more than a decade just about uh, two years back. So, the kind of uh, dream run they had say from 2000 to 2009 uh, is uh, uh, they are no longer able to replicate that those 10 years and from 2010 to 2012 for 2 years they have made several new moves and nothing uh, is uh, working out as they had expected it would. Their share prices are plummeting, market share is uh, uh, plummeting. At this stage, uh, some uh, analysts say or proposing that why not, uh, why Nokia should not exit the low end phone business? Why should they not exit the uh, lower type of feature phone and the standard phone business, even though they have been? Uh, the pioneer, the leader with their user interface, very reliable hardware and many other features. But today they are saying since the margin, the growth, the future uh, rivalry will be in the smartphone uh, market where they are battered by uh, Samsung and Apple. 
uh, and few other people. Uh, the, the analysts are saying therefore, uh, should why should Nokia not exit from standard phone and focus their energy to win the smartphone battle, right. But this is where actually this concept of exit barriers come. Sometimes even if a solution is viable, but it may not be feasible because it, uh, it, it will be a, a wrenching um, uh, exercise uh, to shut down the traditional plants, suppliers, uh, the whole operation that has given them so much wealth and to abandon all of that in search of something that they are still not very good at. Is that a good strategy? Is that a valid strategy in a market which you know, uh, which we know is maturing that is the standard phone market. Even in a country like India now people are saying that 50 percent of the population already have that sort of phone. So, should they now focus uh, only on smartphone or continue to focus uh, on the standard phone and the low end of the market and protect and defend their position there or they want they should do both is food for thought for you in the context of marketing strategy in a maturing and matured market. Let us hear from you and uh, what you think about the Nokia strategy, what would you advise them to do. Thank you.